So the way I understand it anyway is the issue that some people have now, they may be paying uh, for uh, the uh, SR22, say, for two and a half years. Mm -hmm. And then they can't afford to pay it. And then when they pick back up, they have to start over and go, no. So, and, and I was here for that testimony, but that's not entirely accurate. Okay. Um, some factors could play into that. So <clears throat> when you get suspended, you are required to file this for three years from your date of eligibility, okay? So theoretically, I could get a DWI number one right now, be subject to the financial responsibility law that's in effect for three years, and I could sit back and not drive for three years, and that requirement goes away, okay? So <clears throat> if I was driving and got picked up for having no insurance, then all of a sudden it starts over again. So I think what the individual that came and testified was talking about was she got picked up for no insurance, was filing the SR-22, then subsequently couldn't pay for it, so she got, went under suspension and got picked up for no insurance again. That, that act caused it to go three more years. So, so with, um, and with the three-year, uh, I guess penalties, whatever you want to mm -hmm. call it, it's with this language, it still works the same way. Correct, except for the no insurance would not cause you to file the SR-22 anymore. Right. So you but, just get the ticket. Right, but it, if you didn't have insurance for the three years, you weren't didn't get caught driving, <laughs> then okay. it would go away at the end of the three years. Yes. Okay, so no. it, uh, and it will work the same way for the one year on DUI-1? Yes. Okay. okay. Yes. And the only time that gets would be a little bit different is, would be if you were under a life suspension, so for a DUI-3 or more, because you technically are suspended for life, you're never eligible, and then when you prove total abstinence, you become eligible, right. and then it's three years from there. Yeah. Oh, okay. Right? Okay. So. Yeah. So clarification, is it from the point of when you're picked up or when when you get your sentence? So for a DUI, when, I, when the Department of Motor Vehicles issues your suspension, it's a term, so let's use a DUI number one as an example. You would be suspended for 90 days. At the end of 90 days, your three-year period starts, or in this new world, your one-year period starts. But that's not when you get the ticket. That's when you go to court. Afterwards. So when the department issues the suspension, then you have to serve your term. If you're talking a no insurance ticket, so I just got picked up and did not have insurance. Yep. I paid the ticket and went through the Judicial Bureau. Judicial Bureau notifies DMV as soon as it hits the system. When it hits my system and it says no insurance, INS, our system would kick out a suspension letter to you that says you're required to file financial responsibility insurance for the next three years. Gotcha. So any idea how long it is between by the time you get picked up and you actually go through this whole process? So the, years ago we went through a process with the Judicial Bureau where they talked about the life cycle of a ticket. Yep. And it could be 101 days from when you get the ticket until you're actually adjudicated depending on how it all flows out. So once you get the ticket, you have 20 days to notify the Judicial Bureau of how you want to plea. Within 30 days, I believe, after that, they would send you a notice and say, hey, you didn't send us a response. And then they're going to notify the department. The department would give a 20-day lead time. Due process, we have to give the opportunity for a hearing. So after all of those time frames chunk out, it could be quite a while in between getting the ticket and actually having to file the SRP. Does that happen frequently? I don't know how to say how many people just pay the ticket right off. Um, I think some people do and some people don't, so I, I don't have a good answer for that. Along the same lines, you may not know the answer, but say if uh, somebody is going to con contest the DUI, and, and, but they do everything, you know, uh, you know, in a timely manner, and, you know, and, and, uh, and get to court at it, say that the earliest possible date. Mm -hmm. Any idea? from the time they get picked up until the conviction? I don't know. Because I think it, it depends on the courts and their right. busyness right. and stuff. I would imagine Chittenden yeah. County is rather busy you yeah. know, versus one of the smaller sure. ones. So the, the only real problematic, there's two problematic pieces of this bill for the department. The first is the effective date. So it's going to take us some work to be able to achieve this. And upon passage, 
is going to be extremely hard for us. So one of the problems that we have, and, and I was talking with the programmer this morning, um, trying to figure out, so if this went through, how would we do this? Right now, all convictions, are, all suspensions are kicked out based on the conviction code. So a DUI one, we call this DA one, it's going to hit the system. I can easily have that change to issue an SR22 requirement for one year. There are situations where a court, it will be your second or third offense, and the judge will convict you of DUI number one. Although, when it comes to us, we look at your record and say, one, two, three, and I would give you a life suspension. So this is where it gets, programming-wise, it's going to be problematic for us, not insurmountable, but problematic. So we would ask that minimally July 1st, preferably a little bit longer. One of the main reasons I asked for a little bit longer is when you look at the first section four that's in here where it talks about going back in time. That is going to be a manual process because of the fact that I can't just go to the computer system and say, pick out all DUI number ones and end it because some of those DUI number ones may actually be number twos and number threes. Um, it's just the way the system is set up and we, we put the conviction on based on what the judge convicts you, convicts you of, if I can spit that out, not necessarily what number conviction it is. And I don't know if that made sense. Mm -hmm. So September 1st, October 1st, but with, with, when you said July 1st or longer? Yeah, I mean, you know. I, the main thing that would concern me is make sure you have enough time. Yes, yeah, yes, right, because yeah, right, yeah. the last thing I want to do, do is have some right. people that are mm -hmm. not taking care of it right. and others aren't. Right. So I do not have a firm date as to how long this would take us. I mean, clearly, if you said January 1st, 2021, 20, that, that would be about the max that I would ask you for. Um, we have to also balance this with everything else that comes through for July 1st. So any additional time you could give, we would take graciously. Okay, that's helpful. Mm -hmm. Ten months, what's the difference? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Anybody else? So, and oh, you said you can throw other. Let's see. Well, that was just, the two. Just that? Yeah, effective date, and then the, the going backwards is the hard nope. part. Yeah, let me, let me just look at that timing part again. Yeah. So, between now and January 1st, my concern is that you might have a bunch more people that are getting added with three years, mm -hmm. and you're going to have to reprocess them. Is there a way that we can have a July 1st date, uh, effective date, except for the work, or for Section 4, can be a January 1st? You have the date for the waiver component of it, so you're not adding additional yes. ones? No, I think that that's actually wonderful. I didn't even thought of that. Yes, it does. It does. Okay, you need a little time for a set. You need a little time. You don't want any of it affected right away. But but the, as far as the going forward part, July first would be mm -hmm. fine. Yes. Okay. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. And that, that that would accomplish our goal, and also give the uh, department the opportunity to fix the uh, other ones. Yes. Makes sense. Great, thank you. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, Jamie Fear with Primer Piper Eggleston Kramer this afternoon on behalf of the American Property Casualty Insurance Association. That's a national trade association numbering over a thousand or so companies uh, that write automobile property casualty homeowners, uh, several hundred of whom are licensed in Vermont uh, for automobile insurance and include some uh, Vermont-based companies that we all uh, know about. Um, I've been asked to come in and comment on uh, insurance reactions to the proposed uh, strike all on H578, um, and in particular, the proposals to remove uh, two violations from requiring an SR22 and also the time frame to maintain the SR22 from uh, three years to one. Uh, in looking at some of the testimony you received, either written or, or uh, oral, my understanding is you know, the motivation for this bill is in part to uh, address certain populations that are having a hard time sort of coming out of the hole uh, from an SR22 um, or uh, uh, finding, uh, being able to meet that. Oh, let's leave it at that, uh, at that for now. Um, just a word on under, auto insurance underwriting. You know, uh, a number of factors will go into that that a company look at. Um, you know, the automobile, the make, the mileage, how many miles you drive. Uh, a very important part of the underwriting process is the uh, driving record of the individual. Um, 
ensures access through DMV three-year records, which will identify violations, um, uh, other information that helps insurers get a better picture or understanding of uh, the individual they're going to either renew for their insurance or uh, uh, give a new policy to. Um, it's, you know, insurers with that access to information can do a pretty good job in terms of identifying what potential risk for that individual is uh, over time. And uh, it won't surprise you to probably uh, hear that, you know, those individuals that have higher violations, higher, you know, incidences of risk are, are more likely to continue to uh, make violations. Also, those individuals that have, you know, a higher risk profile are likely going to be asked to pay more for their insurance um, so that that premium would then match their potential risk. That's important for a number of reasons. Number one, to, to not only match the risk, but number two, you know, for those of us, not me, who have the bad driving record, those of you with good driving records aren't necessarily subsidizing my poor driving record so that the match, the, the premium matches the risk profile and there isn't sort of subsidization of, uh, of, of policyholders and drivers. Um, Vermont, you know, is a mandatory state in, in terms of insurance. By that, I mean our law, as you're familiar, requires individuals to have insurance, um, and your predecessors and all but New Hampshire have agreed that that's, you know, the right public policy to have and maintain all in. It's better for the system. It reduces uninsured motorist claims. It reduces uh, costs, et cetera. Um, Vermont's uh, uninsured motorist rate currently actually compares very well uh, nationally. The rate is around 6.8%, and the national uh, uninsured rate is around 13%. It's a number that can fluctuate annually, but right now Vermont is uh, compared very well. Um, so, you know, as we look at, as we look at this, we, the auto insurance industry, looks at this, um, you know, it's really, I don't want to put it back on your laps, but it's really sort of a uh, a public policy question. Uh, in the interest of looking to help, you know, uh, those that are facing the challenges there, you know, do you want to run the potential risk of increasing the uninsured motorist population on uh, on Vermont roads? The SR22 is intended to act as an enforcement mechanism for people that are violating the law, not carrying, for example, proof of insurance, not carrying insurance. Um, by removing that deterrent, are you then sort of signaling, well? it may be okay or at least easier to not have to maintain insurance. I don't know how many SR-22s are issued by DMV uh, for this violation. I don't know how many SR-22s are sort of repeat offenders. You know, in other words, do they satisfy the three-year requirement and then that deterrent worked? Or are they back again with another uh, SR-22 requirement? Um, I'm not saying this will happen, but it certainly could be a potential uh, uh, outcome of uh, removing this violation from uh, requiring SR-22s. Um, maybe I'll just sort of leave it at that, I guess. You know, I, I, I look at, you know, the, the, re, the three years to one year, we have no position on that. Um, I don't know if you contemplated. Um, it sounds like there's a, a time frame from two to three years is the potential real challenge from based upon what I've been hearing. I don't know if you thought about an initial step of having the one year apply for you know lack of maintaining insurance and see if that might work as opposed to removing that violation in its entirety. Just a you know thought as I was sitting here, but uh, I just thought I would share at least from our perspective um, uh, potential impact. Now there is an insurance market for individuals that have SR22s, uh, whether they're subsidiaries or affiliates of you know, national companies you might recognize. There's also a specialized market for uh, companies that, that serve uh, SR22 populations. Um, I can tell you that as someone reaches an SR22 level, um, their, you know, risk for some companies may be too rich. You know, they, they may say, sorry, we're not the company for you. You may want to look elsewhere and find uh, auto insurance. Um, so, uh, I just thought I'd mention sort of the market uh, that's there as well. If someone's telling you that they can't find insurance, you can find insurance, but it's going to be more expensive. So, just to make sure I understand your um, your testimony, because because actually um, I just speak with Chairman Marcotte because um, one question would be, you know, we just have to go to, to his committee, and he sent us 
to you. So um, I want to make sure we really understand, or at least I understand, the impact on the insurance industry and where where you come down on this. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, I've kind of been straddling the line. Sorry if I haven't been clear. I mean, it's. I, I think we see the biggest potential impact on increasing the, the number of uninsured motors on, on, on Vermont roads. Um, I don't know the numbers of SR22, so I don't know if we're talking a lot. But if you remove the deterrent or enforcement mechanism, you know, what sort of signal does that send? Uh, but I don't see, in terms of rating or insurance policies, again, for the vast majority of companies I represent, I don't see an impact because, again, when you've reached an SR22, you're a very high risk profile type individual, and you're probably looking at specialized insurance um, or secondary market insurance. Um, so if that's one of your questions, hopefully that's an answer for you. But, uh, a couple questions. So is uh, somebody who doesn't, or who operates without uh, financial responsibility, without insurance, are they considered high risk? It's one violation that gets thrown into that individual prof individual's profile. Um, there's, you know, some companies will take a different, may take a different response. They may say one free bite at the apple, no problem. Others may have an adjustment at premium at renewal time. How does it compare to something like a DUI two or the reckless driving resulting in death and such? I mean, how how does that rate as far as how risky that particular individual is? Somebody who simply has operated, which I don't want people to do, but right. I'm just trying to rate that as far as these other uh, triggers for having an SR22, it, it seems to be a different level. So short answer is I'm not, I'm not exactly sure how, how companies would underwrite you know, those different violations. I can certainly, it sounds like you're looking to move quickly, I can certainly look to try to get that information for you, but um, it would make intuitive sense that there's a, a different level of right. uh, response. And, and my other question was, <coughs> I understand your the logic behind that, all right, this is supposed to be deterrence or enforcement for insuring people are getting insurance. I, do you have any indication that our lower uninsured rate has anything to do with the SR-22 as an enforcement mechanism or deterrence for not having insurance? No, I don't have any data that would, you know, support that. There are a number of factors that would go into, you know, the uninsured motors. Um, what is the level of insurance that we're required to maintain, for example, um, could be uh, one factor. Um, it's interesting. It's, it's, it's also regional. The Northeast and sort of northern Atlantic does very well in terms of its uh, uh, low uninsured motors population. Other parts of the country are up in the 20%. Areas, for example, which is why we have sort of a 13% national rating. Um, but it, you know, expense obviously overall could be a factor that would drive the uninsured motorist rate up or down. And Vermont currently is a very attractive market for the consumer. It's priced competitively. I think we're in the mid 40s in terms of average premium rates compared to other uh, other states. So it's very. Very attractive. Which in, the mid, I'm sorry. in the mid 40s, uh, in terms of the average premium across other states, we're we're situated very well in terms of affordability like that, of like insurance. Lowest, uh, exactly. Uh, yeah. Other states like you know New Jersey have very very high auto insurance, and it's much more of a factor for uh, consumers down there. But obviously, anything that is done to increase the price of insurance would have the potential impact to increase that number of uninsured motors. Does this have, um, would this reflect the uh, bundling of, of homeowners and auto too? Would this affect that at all? Because the insurance companies are really pushing that now, right? You can certainly have, you know, achieve some discounts if you bundle some policies. Right. Um, I don't necessarily think that this would impact the bundling aspect. It would be more, <coughs> the impact would be more on the individual's auto side, auto insurance side. But if they were forced into the, um, uh, the SR22 or whatever it is, they're going to lose that insurance part, and then they're going to lose the bundling discount, right? If they if they lose the auto insurance, yes, they'll have they'll lose that eligibility for a which will cost them more money. Mm -hmm. But there's no way around that anyway. So once right. they lose that, that's it, right? Company right as I mentioned, companies will react differently, you know, to the 
SR22 requirement, but it certainly raises the risk profile. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Uh, okay. Thanks for the invitation. Great. David Chair, with the Attorney General's office, uh, we certainly support the bill as it's been amended. This embodies what we were hoping to see. Uh, a couple quick notes just in response to comments that have come up. Um, uh, Representative Gosselin, you brought up the issue of this seems like something that should be happening a lot or maybe happening a lot. And I did just want to refer you to our uh, written testimony that we gave or that we submitted, I think it was last to the the most recent Tuesday that you were in session, so two weeks ago, <laughs> um, February 24th, we submitted stories that we gathered from our diversion programs around the state because our folks do a lot of work with people who are trying to get relicensed. So, and they were specific to the SR22 issue. So I won't take up too much of the committee's time right now, but you can take a look at that. And there's a bunch of um, stories about how SR22 have been a real obstacle to people getting reinsured and getting relicensed. Um, one note on what you had mentioned, the, um, this was with respect to the suspensions for 1205, and I believe the way I read it is that all 1205 suspensions, which are suspensions that may happen for a DUI, uh, but which are not as a result of a criminal conviction, they're the separate civil suspension that happens when you get a DUI or may happen when you get a DUI, those will all be one-year suspensions because um, it's still covered under the first section, under, um, not under the first section, but under, uh, let me. Under section two. Under section, thank you, <coughs> under section two. So that'll still be one year if, however, there is a c criminal conviction of DUI second or subsequent, that's a three year. So all the civils, one, two, three, four, and two affinities will all be one year? Right, if there's no accompanying conviction. That's the, that'll be the default, the way this is written. Current law, right? It, no. No, it changes current law. Wait, so I'm looking at... So the default for all civils right now is three years. Okay. And the default for all civils going forward will be one year. But again, if somebody gets a criminal <coughs> conviction for a second or subsequent, it's a three year. Okay. Yeah. So just wanted to clarify yeah. that, that piece. Um, Can I just ask you a <coughs> This is a very basic question. Mm -hmm. In what situation would you have three or four civil DUIs as opposed to it eventually becoming, or it, there being a charged DUI? I mean, this is beyond the scope of the bill. It, so it, it, I can just answer, I'm sure you might have an answer too. You know, from my experience practicing, I think it'd be very rare that you would have that many <coughs> suspensions that are, um, that don't also eventually accompany a uh, criminal conviction of a second or subsequent. It certainly is possible because it often is pled down that the first DUI is going down to a negligent operation, but they're still having to do the suspension. And then your second DUI, if you were to get one, then the prosecutor's more likely to be, all right, well, we already we know we already gave you a break, as we can see you got this careless and negligent, but you got the suspension, which means it was a DUI. Mm -hmm. So now we're not going to give you a break. So this is a DUI one from the criminal side, but it's a two on the civil side. Is that a fair uh, theory? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. However, when we get to start talking about like multiple civil suspensions beyond two, I would have trouble believing that there'd be many prosecutors that wouldn't also be charging a second or subsequent DUI for that. You've got your third. You've had two bites of the apple. Right. Right. Okay. right. But yeah, that, yeah. That, that's just a practice question sure. more than anything. And the final piece I would say is. Um, you know, with respect to the licensing, I certainly appreciate the concern around making sure that people have insurance. I think our belief, which I admit is um, anecdotal, but from our, but it is a, a large number of anecdotes <laughs> from our diversion programs, is that removing some of the SR22 burden will make it more likely that people are licensed drivers. And so our belief is that the sort of punitive aspect of this saying it's an enforcement mechanism or uh, the requirement to have it is actually making it less likely that we have licensed drivers on the road because the expense of sustaining the certificate is just too high. And that's the experience that we're seeing for folks who are really actually out there trying to get their licenses back. So do you mean that's why we have more uninsured drivers on the road against an unlicensed? Sorry, both. <laughs> both. Yeah. yeah. I mean, many. The, the plain reality, as we all know, is that many unlicensed 
people are still driving, and that also means they're uninsured. It almost certainly means they're uninsured. So it's a little bit. I use the, I use I may use those terms a little bit interchangeably, but that's because those they often occur interchangeably. So it resulted, yeah, more more insured and more licensed. That's, yes, based on the experience of our program staff, we believe that this will result in more <coughs> insured and more licensed right. drivers. Is there any concern at all that there could be a, a significant increase in DUIs coming up in the near future that we're not ready to handle yet? Oh, you mean for, with respect to the is this a, a cannabis bill uh, question? <laughs> <laughs> you see how diplomatic I'm becoming? <laughs> For our office, never, I think it's fair to say, it prosecutes DUIs. Or if we do, it's incredibly rare. So I, I, would, I think I would defer that question to the uh, state's attorneys to, sit, to what their impression might be. Because we really don't have the institutional experience on what we're seeing on the road, because we just aren't taking those cases, so I'd hesitate to weigh in on that, and I'd let um, John Campbell or James Weber take a swing at that. See, I asked diplomatic, and you answer political. <laughs> <laughs> uh, diplomatic, political, it's uh, same. Because it's not the same, and here he is. <laughs> all right, that was all I had. If there's any no other questions, I'm great. Uh, thank you. So we are going to move on to H594. Um, and I just want to have Harper's bill, which she can't be here, but um, yeah. so we take a look at it. We're going to be taking one here. Ready? She's tough on that. She's tough on that. She's tough on that. She's tough on that. She's yeah, so, so, good afternoon, committee. For the record, Bryn Hare from Legislative Council here to talk about H594. Um, the bill is pretty brief, pretty straightforward. Um, I thought I would give a little history to the felony murder rule first, if that would be helpful. That would be really helpful, what it is, and yeah, all that. Okay. Um, and in, in Vermont. And, yeah. Sure, so um, at common law, um, the felony murder doctrine imputed the intent um, to murder when a death occurred during the perpetration of a felony, um, even if the death was an accident or was otherwise um, non-intentional. Uh, and that, penal or that, uh, that doctrine applied not only to the person who was committing the underlying, fel underlying felony, who caused the death of a person, but also to any accomplice who was there um, assisting in the commission of the felony itself. So I'm not sure if that's clear to folks. No. Right. So okay. it's a felony murder when somebody does Yeah, so, the, so I'm talking about sort of generally, like this, is, this goes back before um, Vermont case law has sort of narrowed the scope of the felony murder doctrine. So I'm going to get to that in a minute. But I'm talking about like historical. Um, cases at common law provided that um, if there was, if a person was committing a felony and um, another person died as a result of that, uh, the commission of the felony, that the intent to commit that murder was sort of imputed on the person who was committing the felony itself. So and separate that, felonies, it, so not necessarily murder, like a... Another, right, it could be like a robbery, for example, right. um, yeah. and... And if there was any accomplices to that robbery, the intent to commit that murder could also be imputed to any accomplices um, in the robbery, even if they didn't, even if that accomplice didn't actually cause the. So, death. using the robbery example, say two people break into some place, uh, um, and the other person gets shot by the homeowner, store owner, could the other, could the second person still be charged yeah so under the right okay they could right. under under the common law like historical common law yes right okay <clears throat> so is that clear okay. so the driver for a bank robbery could 
Yes. Could be held for mm -hmm. felony murder. That's right. Yes, so even if they were not in the area where mm -hmm. the where the killer took place. Part of the overall robbery act. Yes. So I, I'm going to play off of that just a hair. <laughs> Sorry. So again, say a bank robbery, they're you know <laughs> they're they're uh, getting away, <laughs> and and somebody hits them. And kills one of the people in the car. Yes. Okay. Yes. So it, obviously it's all the so Wait a minute. Who who them? Yeah. No, no. The other, the other, the second person that committed the crime could still be charged with. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. right. The, occurred, the getaway car. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, if it okay. occurred uh, mm -hmm. during the commission of a felony, okay. then that's the commission. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really like this when I was in law school. <laughs> so, so this is current law. No, so this is, I'm talking about sort of historical common law. Vermont law has narrowed from this, from, has narrowed the doctrine. So that, that is not current law in Vermont. I'm just sort of giving you a background, a little history of what the felony murder rule is. Oh, all right, all right. All right. Yeah. I'm and now start, you're going to say how it works in Vermont? I am. Okay. I'm it. I was hoping to make this clearer by giving you history. No, it is. It's getting clearer. It is. So um, I'll tell you that um, there was a United States Supreme Court case that talked about the felony murder rule in 1987. And Justice Brennan um, wrote a dissenting opinion in which he said, when he, he called the felony murder doctrine a curious doctrine um, that's a living fossil from a legal era in which all felonies were punishable by death. So in those circumstances, the state of mind of the felon was unimportant because he or she could be um, executed for simply unintentionally, or for intentionally committing the felony, not necessarily any associated murder. So Vermont, uh, the Vermont Supreme Court has interpreted the felony murder rule narrowly to mitigate that harshness of the common law rule. And it's interpreted our murder statute, which is in the bill, 13 BSA 2301, um, to, it's interpreted it narrowly and said that the, the intent of the legislature must have been to limit that common law felony murder rule in order to restrict its harshness. So 13 BSA 2301, which we're going to look at in a minute, it's the murder statute. It precludes yeah. prosecution for first-degree murder based solely on evidence right. that a defendant right. intended to commit one of the felonies that the statute enumerates, and somebody dies during the commission of a felony. That's not um, sufficient for, for felony murder under the statute. So this, in Vermont, so long as the state establishes that the defendant had the requisite mental state for a second-degree murder conviction, any murder committed during the perpetration of one of those enumerated felonies constitutes first-degree murder, regardless of whether the defendant actually committed that killing. So in addition to proving the defendant's <coughs> intent to commit that one of those enumerated felonies, the state also has to establish that the defendant had one of the mental states um, for second-degree murder. And those include either the intent to kill, the intent to do great bodily harm, or a wanton disregard for human life with respect to the murder itself. And that wanton disregard for the human life is obviously the lowest uh, level of mental state. Um, so at a minimum, the state, in order, to, in order to secure a conviction for felony murder, at a minimum, the state would have to prove that the defendant had a wanton disregard for human life and the requisite intent um, to commit the under, the, one of the enumerated felonies even if that person did not actually commit the murder. So the theory behind that limitation, um, that the state has to prove um, the individual liability of each felon, so even if, so if there's one felon that actually committed the murder and there's one accomplice felon that did not commit the murder, that person can still be held um, liable for felony murder if they had that requisite mental state. Um, the court has held that it's fundamentally unfair and in violation of basic principles of individual criminal culpability to hold one felon liable for the unforeseen and unagreed to results of another felon. So each person who's committing that underlying felony has to have that requisite mental state. And if they don't, then um, and the state cannot prove uh, beyond a reasonable doubt that that person had the requisite mental state, the wanton disregard for human life, then there's no felony murder for that, for that person. So 
So. So the felony murder rule is is only when say that there's two people and something happens to one of them. Is that the fel you know what I mean? The felony murder rule is say two people break into the business, one of them gets shot, that and the other one can be charged for murder. Is that a good example of what the felony murder rule is, or is it? Well, it's a little, it's a little broader than that because it, okay. be, it doesn't have to be an accomplice. There could be just one person who's committing an enumerated felony, for example, a robbery. Mm -hmm. um, and if a death results during the commission of that uh, robbery, for example, if um, the, falls down the, stairs. the homeowner, it has to be related to, it has to be caused during the commission of the of okay. the felony. Okay. So, um, but it doesn't have to be one of the. Right, it doesn't have to be, okay, no, that's better. It doesn't have to be one of the people breaking in. Yeah, yeah. So if the victim, like I said, fell down the stairs and, and died for whatever reason. Well, as long as the elements are met. So mm -hmm. there there are elements that, that need to be met in order for, for that to be a, a successful first-degree murder prosecution. Uh, we can... 17-year-olds now can be charged as adults for murder, right? Wrong? <laughs> yes, because... Depending big, on situations. And, yes, because yeah. that's a big 12 offense, so those are um, exempted from the changes in the juvenile jurisdiction laws. Should I say that again? Yes, because if those are murder is a big 12 offense, and um, currently all big, big 12 offenses are excluded for people over the age of... 16, I believe, um, from the from the changes in the juvenile jurisdiction statute. So, all all people who commit offenses that are not Big 12, all juveniles that commit offenses that are not Big 12 offenses, can be charged in the family division now. Right. But this with is the not Big 12, they can be charged as adults. Right. Okay. How does this affect that, or does it? How does the bill affect that? Yeah. Does it affect it because <coughs> taking away the potential to no. convict? 17 year olds as adults? No, I don't think it changes that. It just changes the requirement, the elements um, that are required for a prosecutor to prove if the person is, it, for fe felony murder, if the person is 17 or under. Can the insanity defense be used at all in this? Yes. I mean, if the. Yeah, I'm not a lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Yes. But it doesn't really change the scope of this bill, of how it would be um, looking for words here, help, um, how it would be prosecuted or anything like that. It would just be a, like an existing plea, right? Yeah, nothing about this changes the ability of a, of a defendant to raise the insanity defense. Thanks. So is, is that, um, well, again, so what, so clear and obvious. Yeah, what, what does this bill do then? Yeah, so, um, so I'll so talk about the bill now. Yeah. So section one, this is a one section bill. It amends the murder degrees defined statute. Um, and it provides that it's essentially, like I said, it changes the elements um, for felony murder for juveniles 17 or under. So it um, creates that exception language in, sub, in, in a new subdivision A, and then it creates a new subdivision B that says that an individual who's 17 or younger um, shall have committed first degree murder if the person actually committed the murder, or if they don't actually commit the murder, if that person had the intent to commit murder and assisted another um, person in the commission of that murder. So um, it, changes what is currently required so that the a person who's 17 or under would have actually have to, had to have assisted not only had that mental state for committing murder but also have to would have to have assisted in the commission of the murder not just assisted in the commission of the felony again. Pardon? Can you explain it again? Yep, sure. So, um, like we talked about the felony murder rule uh, that in, under Vermont case law is that if the person um, committed one of the enumerated felonies, 
and also had that minimum requisite mental state of wanton disregard for human life, that person, if the state can prove those elements beyond reasonable doubt, that person could be convicted of first degree murder under the felony murder rule. So they would not have to actually have been involved in the commission of the murder itself. As long as they were involved in the commission of the felony and they had the requisite mental state for murder, secondary degree murder, then they could be found guilty. And this provides that anyone who's 17 or under has to have actually been involved in the commission of the killing itself. They have to have the mental state requirement, and they also have to be involved in the, in the, in the actual commission of the, of the murder. You probably won't be able to answer this. Um, so, and, and I know you won't, because I'm going to ask you a question on policy. So, <laughs> But it, I guess it more or less to the committee is, why wouldn't this apply to somebody committing misdemeanor? Well, that's just the current current law provides that there's only these enumerated felonies that apply um, for the felony murder rule. Right, and what, I, what I'm saying is, somebody to me, you know, if somebody's committing a felony or a misdemeanor and somebody dies, the way I see it, there's no difference. Still committing a crime when somebody's dying, but I understand that there's a certain there's a list there's a certain mm -hmm. uh, certain crimes that Are this is covered under. One of our witnesses making right. Okay. okay, and then the the last subdivision two there just provides that a person who hasn't committed murder but is um, convicted of committing or attempting to commit one of the enumerated felonies shall be sentenced in accordance with the penalties associated with those enumerated felonies. And to be clear, I'm not looking to put this on to Mr. Peters. So just <laughs> there, there was some part you said, mental state, I should have wrote it down, that just caught my earring. Yeah. I can talk about the mental states again that are required for felony murder. Yeah, please. Sure. So um, the elements to felony murder are that the killing occurred while the defendant was committing a felony, one of those enumerated felonies. Mm -hmm. And in causing the death, the defendant acted with an intent to kill, which and in, we can talk about into what intentionally means. Intentionally is an act that's done purposefully and not inadvertently or because of a mistake or because of an accident. It was a purposeful conduct. Or the, or the defendant acted um, with intent to do great bodily harm. And great bodily harm means bodily injury that involves a substantial risk of death, um, serious or permanent disfigurement, or long-term loss or impairment of the function of any part of the body or bodily organ. Or a wanton disregard of the likelihood that death or great bodily harm would result. And a wanton act is a reckless act that's done with extreme indifference to the probability that um, death will occur as a result. So it's greater than like extreme negligence, for example. Where's that language from? Where is that? Um, I think that the case is State v. Jacobs. So it is a case, it's not yes. a statute. Yes. Defining them. <coughs> Give you that case if you want. Okay. Yeah, but there was some word in there that I heard. It, I think it was proving the mental state or something. That it was like, how, how, how does that get done? Um, Which was probably a Judge Grierson. <coughs> so, prosecutors. So, really? yeah, I'm sure that the prosecutors okay. would be glad to talk about that. Um, that they they look at the circumstances of the of the case in order to determine a, a person's intent. There's... With the, with the mental... Right. With the mental state involved. Right. right. Okay. All right. I'll just wait. Right. Thank you.
我是唱歌曲的。OK， 嗯、um, ，So James is Maxine. James, you on? Hi, Madam Chair. Yes, I'm on. Hi. So um, you're welcome. Do you want to um, testify now and then stay on the phone, or do you want to? Um, we have prosecutors and defender generals. Office and the Attorney General's office um, also going to testify. Um, do you want to maybe talk to us now about the um, your work and and um, the thinking behind this um, this bill and your working with other states? That might be helpful. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. And then, can go ahead. Okay. And then, are you able to stay on after after you testify? A absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Right. Well, thank you so much, Madam Chair and, and members of the committee uh, for allowing me to testify today on H-594. It's a really important piece of legislation. Um, I thought that I might just start out by uh, giving a little bit of a history and background about why uh, you, you know we're talking about this issue in the first place in terms of how uh, kids are subject to some of these sorts of penalties under the felony murder rule. Give a little bit of a history of how state courts around the country, including the U.S. Supreme Court, have begun going to evolve in terms of how they look at juvenile culpability relative to adults and then talk specifically about uh, the intricacies of the felony murder rule and why given everything that we know about children it's not an appropriate sanction to have in place um, in terms of the, the very harsh penalty that comes down on them given their diminished culpability. Uh, but let me first start off by thanking Representative Rachelson for introducing this bill. Um, like I said, it's a really important piece of legislation that we see as integral to protecting the human rights of children in the U.S. justice system. Um, and Excuse a little me, bit James. Can you, um, also, um, yeah. I don't, can you um, introduce yourself for the record in your, um, in your affiliation, your organization, please? Absolutely. Uh, James Dold, for the record, and I'm representing Human Rights for Kids. Uh, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization that's dedicated to promoting and protecting and advancing the human rights of children um, in the justice system. We work all across the country. We engage in policy advocacy as well as amicus advocacy in state courts and the federal courts um, uh, across the country. Um, so a little bit of history about this issue and sort of how we got to this place where we see so many kids subject to harsh penalties in the adult criminal justice system, really sort of rewind the clock and you go back to the late 1980s and early 1990s, and there was a juvenile crime wave that had happened, and a group of, a group of uh, criminologists had theorized that there was this new group of super predator children who were coming of age who were more violent and less remorseful than ever before. These children were characterized as being godless, jobless, and fatherless, and states were really urged to make it easier to transfer children into the adult criminal justice system at that time to stem the coming crime wave that these criminologists believed was going to happen. So, you know, from the late 1980s into the mid-1990s and a little bit later, uh, we see this rash of state legislation across the country that does just that, makes it very easy for kids uh, to get transferred into the adult system, which opens them up to these more sort of extreme punishments like life imprisonment, as well as what we term de facto life sentences where kids can get uh, 30, 35, 40, 50 year sentences that may not be age appropriate or trauma informed given the particular circumstance of the child and their uh, history and their background. Um, so, you know, we fast forward a little bit um, over the next 15 to 20 years. And there's a lot of new uh, juvenile brain and behavioral development science that comes out that really affirms what uh, legal scholars and what parents, uh, anybody who's raised children really knows, which is that children are fundamentally different from adults. But for the first time, uh, the science was actually able to prove that the prefrontal cortex in children isn't fully developed in the way that it is in an adult. And so as a result of that, they actually rely by the more primitive part of the brain called the amygdala uh, to process information and make decisions. Uh, it's because of this that children are more prone and susceptible to peer pressure. Uh, they're less likely to think through the long-term implications of their, of their decision-making or the consequences of their actions uh, and why they're more impetuous. Now, uh, it's one of the things that also, uh, given what we know about the child's brain development, it's also what makes kids 
particularly susceptible to being uh, being able to be rehabilitated over time, particularly as their brain matures and uh, their development happens over uh, over a period of time, which is also why studies have shown that when you look at the rate of, of uh, criminal behavior, delinquent behavior that juveniles engage in, what we see is that delinquency and criminal behavior in general is, is very common in adolescent children. Um, and, but by the time children reach the age of 22, people, uh, kids who've been involved in the justice system, we see a, a marked drop off of their engagement in criminal behavior. And by the time they reach the age of 28, uh, over 85% of them cease engaging in any sort of criminal or delinquent behavior. And we call this uh, this notion of aging out of crime uh, because we see so many kids who you know, come into the system but after they learn they grow, they no longer engage in the same sorts of conduct that, that got them there in the first place. Uh, this whole theory and this notion as well as this underlying juvenile brain behavioral development science is backed up by how we treat children in every other area of society. Uh, we don't let children vote, they can't serve in the military, they can't enter the contract, they can't get married. We have certain protections in place to protect them from predators and people who prey upon them because we inherently recognize that children are vulnerable, they're susceptible to uh, being pressured into certain uh, uh, activities, and they don't necessarily think about uh, issues in the same way that adults do. And so we sort of place these protections on them to protect them from others as well as protect them from themselves. Uh, against this backdrop, the U.S. Supreme Court and federal courts and state courts around the country uh, began to sort of look at the issue of juvenile sentencing starting back really in, in 1988 with a case called Oklahoma v. Thompson where the court struck down the death penalty for children under the age of 16. Um, but then sort of extended that doctrine in recent years um, to kids under the age of 18 in a case called Roper v. Simmons, relying a lot on the juvenile brain and behavioral development side. These two cases uh, stand for the proposition that kids are different and that the underlying rationale for getting rid of the death penalty for children uh, really is informed by this idea that uh, the penological justification for imposing the harshest possible punishment, that is this idea of retribution or incapacitation uh, or retribution, uh, really fall away when we look at the distinctive characteristics of youth. Uh, that is everything that I just explained based on the juvenile brain and behavioral development science, as well as children's capacity to grow and mature over time. Uh, it's this underlying research and this underlying information uh, that the court relied on to say that given everything that we know, the use of these extreme punishments on children are disproportionate for child offenders because they have a diminished culpability relative to adults. Uh, that is to say that when a child and an adult, let's just say a 17-year-old, for example, um, commits the same crime that a 30-year-old commits, uh, while both crimes, depending on you know what, what the particular circumstances are, are going to be terrible, um, we are going to hold the adult offender uh, more culpable and more uh, responsible for their conduct because their brains are fully developed relative to children who are still going through that process of, of development and maturity. So as the court you know, lays the foundation for those kids are different doctrine, uh, they issued several more Supreme Court rulings in recent years. In 2010, they struck down life without parole for non-homicide offenses and then moved into the issue of life without parole for kids even convicted of homicide-related offenses. And one of the cases that I wanted to highlight, uh, Miller v. Alabama, it's relevant to this conversation because it involved a young man by the name of Cuntsville Jackson who had been convicted under a theory of felony murder. Uh, in Mr. Jackson's case, he was 14 years old. Him and another uh, child offender uh, decided that they were gonna go and uh, rob a arcade. Um, now, the, the whole sort of theory here was that, you know, the one kid was gonna go in, scare the clerk into giving uh, the, uh, him the money. Uh, Control Jackson's role was gonna be for him to stand as a lookout. Um, so he actually never went into the store. He was standing on the outside of the store um, while his friend went in with what he thought was going to be, you know, kind of just a smash and grab. He was going to grab the cash and run out. Um, but the other kid ended up having a gun on him uh, and ended up shooting and killing the store clerk. 
and as uh, the kid, you know, he comes out of the store, uh, he takes off and runs. Mr. Jackson, you know, not having any idea that, you know, his co-defendant, you know, was going in there and was going to kill this guy, was still equally liable under the felony murder rule because you're you're essentially assumed to have transferred intent. That is, even if you don't pull the trigger, even if you don't intend for anybody to get killed, uh, the law holds you responsible uh, for any uh, quote-unquote foreseeable consequences or probable consequences that could result as a result of you engaging in an underlying felony offense. And James, that's what, James, we have a, yeah. Yeah. James, Tom Berta here. I met you a couple of weeks ago when you were in here. But, um, so in and the question may not be for you, it may be for somebody else that's around the table here. In, in Vermont, can a 14-year-old be charged with this? Uh, so in Vermont, I don't know, so that might be a great question for the, um, the public defender of the Attorney General's office. I know that 16 and 17-year-olds certainly could. I, I right. don't know the age of the cutoff for, for the transfer law. Right, right. Yeah, there, there's some people in here that might be able to answer, but I, I want to get that out on the table anyway, and maybe they can uh, address it when they uh, sit in the witness chair. But thank and, you. And um, James Maxine, I should have told you, we need to um, get everybody in and stop by um, 4 o'clock because there's a, um, a special um, uh, public hearing that, um, that members may want to go to. So just um, if I could ask you to speak for maybe just another few minutes, because I do want to make sure that we hear from um, uh, the other pro the folks that are in there, the prosecutors, Defender General's office, and Attorney General's office. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. I'll, I will make my remarks relatively quick then. Um, so as you know, as I was saying, that you know, this, this notion, this doctrine of kids are different, really, you know, set off this idea that there are individual circumstances that Sentencers, judges, courts need to be looking at when it comes to kids. And in the Miller case, uh, the court said that, you know, a sentencer misses too much if they treat every child as an adult and, and sentence every child as an adult without regard for their child status. And the reason that H-594 is so important is because it, it gets rid of the felony murder rule that, you know, doesn't have this distinguishing characteristics for when, you know, an adult commits a felony offense and somebody ends up getting killed as a result uh, versus a child who doesn't have the same capacity to foresee unintended consequences. So the Vermont Supreme Court, um, just very briefly, uh, sort of affirmed the felony murder rule in 2017 and basically there. And, you know, essentially the elements for this is, you know, essentially if the state proves that a defendant simply had the intent to commit an enumerated felony and that the defendant had, at a minimum, a wanton disregard for human life, that is to say that they acted with extreme recklessness and extremely reckless conduct that disregards the probable consequences of taking a human life. Um, and so, you know, you don't have to, a child doesn't have to uh, necessarily intend for anybody to, to be hurt or killed. They can simply be, like in control case, uh, go along with a, a robbery um, and not think, you know, anybody's armed or anything, that, you know, how, anybody can be killed as a result. And yet they can still be held liable because the underlying felony offense is such that um, there's this sort of presumption that the, the, the conduct itself disregards the, the, the possibility that a person could die during the commission of the, the, the offense. And this is a problem with when you have legal standards that hold children to the same standards as adults. Because we could certainly all agree that, you know, for an adult offender, you know, they're going to be able to foresee unintended consequences that a, a child might not necessarily be able to. Um, it, and so it's against that backdrop that we really want to be able to say that, you know, we're not going to hold children to the same legal standards that we do adults. And it's not to say that we're trying to exalt children. Um, their responsibility uh, for the harm that's caused by their actions. Quite the contrary, we want to be able to hold them responsible uh, for what they engage in and the harm that they cause, but we want to do so in a way that's age-appropriate and trauma-informed and reflects what we know about children and is reflective of how we treat children differently in every single other area of our laws outside of the criminal context. 
Um, and so, you know, under age 594, uh, kids who, you know, engage in an underlying felony offense uh, where somebody ends up being killed but they don't intend for somebody to be killed or where they don't act with an intent to aid or invent that person um, will still be held liable, uh, criminally liable for their conduct. They will just be convicted and sentenced under the underlying felony offense for which they originally engaged in that conduct. Um, and so against that backdrop that, you know, we would really urge the committee uh, to support this bill as a necessary change in the law uh, to comport with international human rights standards, to comport with the juvenile brain and behavioral development science that shows us that we need to be treating children differently in the justice system and have different legal standards for them. It's not about absolving anybody of any culpability, but it is to say it is a question of degree and what should be the consequences for a kid like in Control Jackson's case or so many other kids who don't necessarily intend for someone to be killed but engage in an underlying felony offense where unfortunately that does happen. And so we would submit that the appropriate response in such a case is to have a trauma-informed and age-appropriate sentence because when a child is sentenced under this, the current regime, um, they're facing a 35-year-to-life sentence. That's a mandatory minimum. So they're going to spend a minimum of 35 years in prison for not having actually killed anybody or intended for anybody to be killed. And it's against that backdrop that we want to make sure that House Bill uh, 594 is enacted into law so that uh, we treat our children uh, in more age appropriate ways and protect their human rights. And with that, I will go ahead and close my testimony. I'll be happy to stay on the phone and answer any questions that committee members may have. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Marshall Paul from the Office of Defender General. Um, I want to start by saying that we support this bill in concept. Uh, the idea of, you know, in particular, of limiting juveniles' exposure to uh, sentencing, particularly for offenses that um, really involve a really sophisticated uh, level of intent is a good idea, largely because kids' brains are not developed enough to really effectively develop sophisticated levels of intent. So we think it's a good idea. However, we have some real concerns about the way the bill is drafted. Um, so just to begin with from, from the outset, this is a really complicated area of law, and it's particularly complicated in Vermont. We are, as far as I can tell, the only state in the union that does not have a codified murder statute. Uh, it used to be us in Tennessee that still had common law murder statutes. Tennessee, it seems, has codified its murder statute. So nowhere in our statutory scheme, nowhere in Section 2301 or anywhere else in the statutes do you find a definition of murder. Instead, you just find a statute that says, is if you commit murder, then you shall be punished at, like this. And if you commit murder in a different way, you shall be punished like this. But there's nowhere that it actually spells out the elements of murder. So one of the problems with that is that when you start taking statutes and putting the elements of a common law offense into a statute, you really run the risk of changing the nature of the offense because for years and years and years, this law has developed through court decisions, not through statutory refinement. Um, and so it's super important to be very careful if we go down the road of writing this into statute that we don't put anything into the statute that doesn't exist in the common law explicitly and that we don't do it in any way that implies that we are changing the common law um, around murder. And so that's why I have some concerns about this. And I'll start my concerns with when you look at the proposed language in, um, let's see. So to begin with, I'll go to the end. Um, the language in section B2, uh, we would just say is, actually it's not B2, it is, or no, it is B2. Never mind, B2. We would say that that's unnecessary. All that language actually says is that someone who hasn't committed murder shouldn't be punished for committing murder. And if they've committed a felony, they should be punished for the felony they committed, um, which is the law anyway. And so putting this in there, the concern would be that by saying it, it some way implies that either this wasn't the case before, and therefore the legislature is repealing something, or, uh, you know, there's, 
as a defense attorney, I would come up with a lot of arguments about what the legislature must have meant by doing something that everybody presumed to be the law already and putting it in statute, that that must mean that it wasn't the law in the first place or something. It just adds confusion where there doesn't need to be any. Same with section um, B1A. So this B1A and B, which really talk about how a person under the age of 17 can commit murder. And what it basically does is tries to say, someone under the age of 17 can commit murder by doing any of the first two things in Section A, but not the third thing in Section A. I think there's a lot easier of a way to do that. If we were going to do that, I think the better way would be to, in subsection A, to simply start with the existing statute and create some, sub, some subsections in subsection A so that it would say murder committed by means of subsection 1, poison, subsection 2, lying in wait, subsection 3, willful, deliberate, and premeditated killing, or subsection 4, committed in perpetrating or attempting to perpetrate arson, sexual assault, aggravated, etc. Um, shall be murder in the first degree, all other kinds of murder shall be murder in the second degree. And then you could drop a subsection B, which said no one under the no one shall be charged with uh, subsection A for under the for an offense committed under the age of 17. That way you wouldn't be tinkering with the sort of substantive language, uh, but still be accomplishing the same thing, which is saying someone under the, who commits one of these offenses under the age of 17 should not get a first-degree murder sentence for it. Now, just to kind of, I don't want to take up too much of John's time, so I'll try to knock this out in like two minutes, just to not um, see if a little bit of background as to why we support this conceptually. Felony murder rule has always been very controversial. It started out as a rule that really accomplished nothing uh, because it was a rule that said that if you committed, if, if you killed someone while committing a felony, then you would be punished as if you had intentionally murdered them. When they, when they created that rule at the time, the punishment for committing a murder was exactly the same as the punishment for committing any felony. So saying that if you commit a felony and somebody dies, you get punished for murder was really kind of meaningless. Um, that was true for quite a long time. As that changed, it really exposed some of the problems with this doctrine where you really are you wind up with some really absurd results. So for example, in Vermont, I have a client who's serving life without parole for felony murder. Um, he is not the person who actually killed someone. Um, he was a accessory. Um, the person who actually killed someone is not, did not get life without parole. And that's something that you see all the time. You see people who get, the, where the person who actually committed the, the killing gets the lesser sentence than the person who didn't c commit the killing. And you can see that, uh, you know, when, when I look at cases, not just in Vermont, but in neighboring states where that's happened, you really see some, um, some really kind of scary optics around that. Uh, you know, there's a case from New Hampshire I'm aware of where two people committed a rape and murder. One person was the one who actually committed the, the murder. The other person was in the car at the time that the murder was committed. The person who committed the murder was a middle-aged white man from New Hampshire. The person who was waiting in the car was a younger black man from somewhere in Massachusetts. Um, that guy got life without. The guy who actually committed the murder didn't. Um, so that's a, that's a scenario that can come up. It sort of speaks to the absurdity of saying we're going to punish people as if they committed murder when they, in fact, didn't. Um, so we, we certainly support that. And just to touch on a question that was asked uh, earlier, so uh, this murder is the one offense in Vermont that you can be charged with at least as a juvenile all the way down to age zero. There is no bottom age for murder. Um, so you can be charged as a delinquent with committing murder when you're two years old. Now, that's never happened. Um, and honestly, I don't think that you could ever really craft a situation where somebody under the age of 10 had the mental state that it took to commit a murder. Um, so, but if you are 14 or older, uh, any of these offenses, it's not a may be charged in adult court, it's a must be charged in adult court. They are all these big 12 offenses, if you're over the age of 14, mandatory adult court. You can move to transfer down, um, but it's got to start charged in adult court. Um, so 
not to put words in your mouth, but uh, what, what I kind of took from your testimony was that maybe you would like to see our, our murder uh, um, laws codified before doing something like this? Would it make things simpler? I don't know about that, and I'm not actually sure that it's a good I, If you could ask me, in, if we could go back in time to 1983 and codify our murder laws then, that might make a lot more sense than doing it now. The reason being that there's a lot of law that's developed and built up in the courts around murder, because it's not just murder, it's all of our homicide offenses. So it's murder, uh, second-degree murder, first-degree murder, second-degree murder, voluntary manslaughter, involuntary manslaughter, we have a real body of law built up that it would be hard to take that body of law and codify it, um, and it would be hard to codify a law that is consistent with that. So you'd really be looking at making substantive change to that, and I don't, you know, I don't know if there's appetite for making substantive change to our homicide laws at this point. Okay. So. Thank you. Uh, thank you, committee. Uh, John Campbell, executive director of the state's attorney's sheriff's uh, here for uh, James Pepper, who was going to testify, but his his son is not is, is ill, so they're taking care of Bob. So and then he just texted me, and unfortunately, they're on the way to the hospital because they're having you know, pneumonia. Anyway, uh, the uh, first, if I could say that this um, uh, statute, or the the bill, I had we had sent it around to the, the various state attorneys, and um, there was only one state attorney that was supportive. Uh, everyone else uh, did not support this. And you know, really, what it comes down to is this is a policy decision that you all are going to have to make. And uh, you know, personally, I believe that um, that there is a purpose for this law. Uh, it's not one that you see uh, used commonly used. It's it's just not. It's a it's one where there has to be some very specific facts. Um, Bryn went through the the elements and uh, the the elements again. They as Marshall pointed out that this is really developed more through our case law than what you read in the statute. Because if you read in the statute, the statute is just one of those ones where. Actually, I think that there are probably more problems even than than um, uh, than uh, Marshall has pointed out. I think that that there's there's a possibility of being challenged. But you know, the cases that where it has been used uh, was uh, in fact the, the O'Hagan case is, a, is is probably the prime example, and that was the Northeast Kingdom where uh, there were three, uh, I believe they were cousins. They went in with the intent to uh, uh, burglarize uh, Mrs. O'Hagan's house. And uh, they decided that they were going to bring uh, guns to it, but they all decided they were going to be unloading guns, except for one of them. Uh, one decided to bring a loading gun, and uh, of course, when they went in there, uh, Mrs. O'Hagan was not asleep like they planned or they thought, and uh, there was uh, an altercation ensued, and the one person shot Mrs. O'Hagan and killed her, and the other gentlemen went in there, and they uh, were... Um, uh, charged with felony murder in this case. And then this case obviously went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said that even though they, they thought, well, you know, I've got an unloaded gun, so I shouldn't be, you know, nothing's going to happen, they should realize that there was a chance, a very significant chance, of some bodily injury, death or bodily injury happening, whether it be from their gun or from somebody that might be inside that might have a gun of their own when they see someone else with a gun. Um, and so that. Uh, uh, they found it's um, the uh, uh, they found that the that the felony murder rule did apply. You so you have to look at I think what uh, we are trying to accomplish with the felony murder rule here in Vermont. Uh, it is different than you know, almost any place else in the country, and certainly the one that we all learned in law school um, that has changed drastically uh, through um, uh, through uh, either common law. Uh, decisions by courts uh, or statutory changes, and and probably for the best, because I think that the original felony murder rule, as, as again as Marshall pointed out, it just it didn't it it sometimes reached absurd results. And uh, however, I think that the courts through the uh, the states have seen this uh, and they have acted accordingly. So I also believe that if you start to um, amend this current statute, you really have to stand a chance of, of, I hate to use the word mucking, but mucking it up. 
um, not only from the standpoint of the potential of uh, questioning what actually, um, you know, if a murder can be charged here or, mur or some other crime can be charged, but also in thinking about all of the other work that you all have done over this past year and um, um, the past couple of years as far as sentencing and the fact that you have adjusted uh, sentences down and you know you have a situation where if it's a certain person they're gonna with good time and and with this and with that you know they somebody who might have gotten a 15 year sentence is down now to seven years uh, a seven year sentence and, um, and finally because I know you got to get out of my four the last thing I wanted to say was just also to remind you that that this, uh, uh, the felony murder, murder rule, as far as to dropping it down with the age, I, I think it came out of, and I was not here, it came out of the case, it was a terrible case up in Essex, where the two 12-year-old girls were uh, abducted by 14 and, or 13 and 14-year-old boys who um, raped, tortured, and murdered one of the girls, and one, uh, fortunately, they left both of them to die, but one, fortunately, um, made it out. Uh, the one person is still serving uh, time in, in prison now, but the one uh, one of the boys was uh, he was arrested and, it was, and he's I think they he was in DCF custody for two years. Then um, he got out, changed his name, and nobody knows where he is now today. So uh, this if this was something that we used uh, on a regular basis, then it was done. Um, Frequently and without really good cause, I would say you should take a serious look at it. But even then, I would take a serious look to where you make sure that you cover all your bases, not all your eyes, and cross all your teeth. Um, however, it's not really, it's not used that frequently. And so I, it's not as if you don't act right now that something terrible is going to happen or that someone is going to be negatively impacted. So uh, I would just urge you uh, to use caution uh, in dealing with this, um, with this statute and this bill. Thank you. 